blessed to have uh, Pastor L, who actually cares so much about our congregation, come and preach for us. So let's all welcome him. Well, it's uh, wonderful seeing all of you once again. Uh, it's a privilege for me to stand here and preach the Word of God because I don't get to do it that many times anymore. Um, if you could all stand with me, let us uh, listen to God's Word as I read from Exodus 3, verses 1 through 12. And here's the reading of God's Word. Now Moses was keeping the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the wilderness and came to the mount of God unto Horeb. And the angel of Jehovah appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside now and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when Jehovah saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet. For the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Amen. Please be seated. Have you ever wondered, why did God save me? Why did God save us? Why did he go through all that trouble of sending his one and only son to earth so that he can live a sinless life in order to die in our place. Well, I want to answer that question through this story that's found in Exodus chapter 3. God going through extreme lengths to bring the Israelites out of Egypt. It's a parallel story to ours. Because as the Israelites were slaves, enslaved in Egypt, guess how we were before Christ came? We were enslaved by sin. Just like the Israelites had no power to overcome their captors, we had no power to overcome our captor, which was because we were in sin. Now, before we get into it, we need to know what happened in chapter 2. Back in chapter 2, verses 24 and 25, it says, God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. When you read that, it does at least two things. First of all, those verses confirm the unity of God's plan. Israel's exodus from Egypt is God's fulfillment of his promises to the patriarchs. When I, when I use that word patriarch, I'm talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all those forefathers that came before so God isn't initiating a new plan here. He is simply fulfilling what he has already told to the patriarchs back in the book of Genesis. So when God hears his people's groans, he recalls the covenant that he made with Abraham. 
and God's emancipation of Israel from Egypt was, not, was part of his perfect and eternal plan and part of the blessings promised in that relationship that he had established with Abraham. So it's very important for us to appreciate the continuity of what God is doing under this old covenant. Now, the reason why this is so important to understand is because there are some people who like to think that God continually changes when things don't go as planned. God has a plan, and when his people, as we often do, we fail, then God somehow begins a new plan. It's like saying God has plan A, and it didn't work. So he goes to plan B and plan C and so on. Well, what we see here in Exodus chapter 2 is that God is not instituting a new plan, plan B. This is part of the plan A that he had back in Genesis. God knows all things. He had told Abraham about this very situation that his people were going to be in back in Genesis. And now he's carrying out the plan that he had told him. And so we need to see that God's plan of salvation is the same. The second thing is, after God heard the groaning of Israel and remembering his covenant with Abraham and taking notice of the children of Israel, it leaves you waiting expectantly. You're thinking, well, God sees his people suffering, so what is he going to do next, right? And here's your answer. In Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, the next thing that God does is he reveals himself to a man that he has chosen to be the deliverer of his people. In verses 1 through 3, we see Moses' initial encounter with God at the burning bush. But in verses 1 through 3, Moses doesn't quite know yet what he's looking at. He's curious. He doesn't know that this is the manifest, manifestation of God. In verses 4 through 6, we see the rest of the story in Moses' encounter with God at the burning bush. Now, he knows who it is, and you will notice his reaction in verses 4 through 6 is very different than the reaction that he had in verses 1 through 3. And the reason is he comes to know who is calling him, who is talking to him. And then when you get to verses 7 through 10, you see God announcing to Moses his heart for his people, Israel. You already know how God feels about Israel because we have the advantage of reading chapter 2. But it was Moses' first time hearing God's heart for his people. Moses is now going to hear God's heart for his people and then having heard God's heart for his people, in verse 10, God is going to call Moses to go and deliver his people from Egypt. And then finally, in verses 11 and 12, God gives the reason why he will set his people free from slavery. So let me give you the conclusion as I start my message. Verse 12, if you read it again, says, And he said, meaning God, certainly I will be with you, and this shall be the token unto you that I have sent you. When you have brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. The answer to the question, why did God save me? Why did God save us? Is ultimately so that we can worship him. So that we can worship him. All right. First, verses 1 through 3, we see Moses' unexpected and strange encounter with God before he realizes who it is. In these verses, God reveals himself to Moses visibly through what theologians call a theophany. This word simply means a visible manifestation of God. God reveals himself to Moses, and his response is curiosity. He's like, what is this? Now, I want you to notice that Moses was not searching for God or searching for meaning in life. Right? Why am I here? He wasn't doing that. What was he doing? He was doing something very mundane. He was herding a flock of sheep. He was just doing what he does every day. That's what he did. Every day in the desert. Go out and 
care for the sheep. And then he comes into contact with God almost by accident. Now, we need to understand that this was no accident. God had planned to meet Moses, but, Mo but Moses didn't know that. We see here that Moses is curious at what he sees. There's a bush that is burning. There's fire coming out of it, but then it wasn't being burned up. The bush is ablaze, but the leaves and the stems are not being consumed. And so it piques Moses' interest. What's going on here? And so he wants to go investigate. He says, what is this strange sight? And he begins to make his way towards that bush. And so this strange sight draws Moses towards it. So what's going on here? Well, God is drawing near to Moses and reveals himself to him. You see, God always takes the initiative in revealing himself to his people. But we learn several other things about God in this passage. First of all, we learn that God is a spirit. And he's not tied to some specific place. And so why is that important? We need to learn that there is nothing holy about a place. But there is something holy about God's presence. There's nothing sacred about that mountain which would have led Moses to go there. It's that God was there. And that's what made it holy. Secondly, I want you to know, and we'll carry this through as we look at verse 4 through 6, a true revelation of God to Moses is not going to be in the vision of that burning bush. But rather, it is when God speaks to Moses. In other words, the true revelation was in God's word and not in the sight of the burning bush. Did Moses fear the bush when he saw it? No. He was more curious. Then that's why he was going to go investigate. It's like, you know, you hear about these fantastic places like Grand Canyon, right? We don't go, oh, I'm afraid to go there. No, we are, it piques our interest when people come in and tell us about it. So we will, oh, I want to go and check it out myself, right? And when you go, you're like, wow, this is amazing. And you tell other people. Well, that's the attitude that Moses had about this burning bush. I know we are living in a time when our experience is more important than God's word. We want to experience God and we take that as more authoritative than God's word. And we need to understand that you have encountered God only when his word is revealed to you. So I want, I want that to sink in, right? You encounter God with his word, not in these fantastic experiences that you are maybe wanting. And that's why it's so, so important to be in God's word each and every day. Now let's look at verse four through six. The encounter, the encounter heightens. God reveals himself to Moses, but this time in verses four through six, he does so by his word, by his command and by his promise. Now, Moses is not merely curious when that happens. He is awestruck. Moses' encounter with the self-revealed God here is through his word, and it brings about a corresponding fear of God. Like I said before, the sight of the bush did not bring fear, but when God spoke, that's when Moses was afraid. The call of Moses in verse 4 parallels the calls of Abraham and Jacob. Notice the word, when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses, and Moses responds, here I am. So this is exactly what happens with Abraham back in Genesis 22 and also Jacob in Genesis 46. And th similar things will happen to Gideon in book of Judges as well as Jeremiah, the prophet. So God, in verse 5, commands Moses to stop coming towards the bush. Not because God is unapproachable by his people, but look at two things, what God says. Moses must not approach God before he knows exactly who he is approaching. And God will identify himself as the God of his father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, before Moses can approach. So Moses needs to know who 
is calling him from that bush. It is God. And what does this teach us? Is that before you can truly worship God properly, you need to know who you're worshiping. So as you're sitting here, do you know why you're here? Do you know who you're worshiping? Secondly, Moses must not approach God until God gives him the instruction as to how he is to approach him. Is that not the way it should be when it comes to worshiping our almighty God? God must reveal himself to you, and then God must tell you how you should approach him in worship. And that's exactly what we see in this chapter, chapter 3. In verse 5, God tells Moses to take his sandals from his feet. This was a sign of reverence and humility in that culture. And notice again that the ground is holy. Not because there was that burning bush, but because of the very presence of God was there. This is the first time that the word holy is used in the Bible, and it is used direct connection with God. There is a great deal of significance in that. The sight of the burning bush did not make the place holy, but it was the presence of God that made the ground holy. The nations around Israel believed in holy trees and holy bushes and holy sites and holy places. Israel didn't, but the place is holy because God is there. That's always the way true worship happens. It is through God's presence. And the reason why we gather here is not because of this building, but God said he will meet you when his people gather together to worship him. And so we could guarantee, I could guarantee that God is here with us right now as we gather to worship him. In verse 6, God goes on to identify himself as the God of the patriarchs. Not a new and different and unknown God, but he is the God who had revealed himself previously to the patriarchs, and now he is revealing himself more clearly than ever before to Moses, and he will reveal himself to the people of Israel. But the emphasis throughout this section is that God is known by his own initiative, and he is known by his word. He, he cannot be approached apart from his word. In Exodus 3, we are reminded that our knowledge of God is dependent upon God revealing himself. God draws Moses to the burning bush, which was not consumed. But it wasn't until God spoke to him that Moses realized that it was God. And here again, we are reminded that God has to take the initiative if we are going to enter into a relationship with him. If we are going to worship him. If he is going to be known personally, if he's going to be known savingly, then he, might, he must make himself known to us. And the reason is because our sin and its blinding moral effects make it impossible for us to work our way back to a saving knowledge of God. He must come to us and reveal himself. And so all of us need to be understand that we need to feel blessed because God has revealed himself to us and that's why we are here worshiping him. If he didn't do that, you'd probably be somewhere else doing other things. Now let's go to verses 7 through 10 and we see something else here. God announces his concern for Israel and he gives his call to Moses. So we've already been told about God's concern for his people back in chapter 2. And now God reveals that fact to Moses. And what's Moses' job going to be? It's going to be parallel to what God has just done. Even as God revealed himself to Moses, now Moses is going to reveal God to the people of Israel as well as to Pharaoh. God is going to display himself and he's going to use Moses to do it. And so in preparing Moses to be a messenger, the very first thing that he does is he shares his heart for his people with Moses. He says, Moses, let me tell you about my heart, my love for my people. I've seen them, I've given heed to them, and I'm coming down. 
Those are the three things he says. I've seen the oppression that they are enduring. I have given heed to their cries and I'm coming down to help. He's sharing his heart with Moses so that Moses can share his heart with people of God. So Moses' job is going to be a human revealer of God to his people. But he needs to understand from God what God, God's heart is like. And so that's why God is sharing his heart to Moses. And next, God gives Moses a description of the land that he's going to take his people to. And then in verse 10, God commissions Moses to the work. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So Moses is commissioned there, by the way, just like Christ commissions apostles in John chapter 20, verse 21. He is told that he is to go to Pharaoh and he is to bring the children out. One of the things that we learn here, and we're going to learn it very quickly with Moses' response, is that God uses human instruments to accomplish his will. In this case, he's appointing Moses as a human mediator, as a human leader and deliverer for his people. But God remains the ultimate deliverer of his people. God himself is the one upon whom all these plans depends. When we are chosen to be used by God, we should be honored and give him all the glory. But don't get proud or haughty because we can be replaced. God's purpose will be completed whether he uses you or he uses someone else. Here he uses Moses, but it is God who will deliver his people. That is the lesson that Moses is going to have to learn. But that's important for us to remember. So when God chooses you to share the good news of the gospel with your friend, you should say, wow, God is using me, and feel blessed. But don't get that to your head. We're like, yeah, God is using me, so I'm special. Um, I used to think that way when I was doing youth group way back when. I thought I was the, the best youth pastor in the world, and um, all these kids were flocking to the church, and I thought, man, I'm, um, you know, indisposable. I'm so important. But later in life, when I came back to the area and none of the kids came to the church that I was at, I'm like, oh, maybe I wasn't that important, right? So when God does use you, feel special in that God chose to share the message of the gospel through you to someone else. But don't think that, you know, don't get proud because of that. <clears throat> I believe that through this, we, an important lesson is to be learned from this passage. Ultimately, it is God who saves us and who delivers Israel. And that's exactly what God did when God the Son came down to earth himself in order to save us. He did not choose another person to die for us. He came down himself to save us. So I want to go back to the question that I asked in the beginning. Why does God go through all this trouble of saving me? Why did he go through all that trouble of saving us? Especially a people who will continue to sin and rebel against him. The amazing answer is that he saves us so that we can worship him. Have you ever thought about that? He saves us so that we can worship him. That is the reason why he created us. We are most content and satisfied when we are worshiping God. But sin has changed all that. Have you ever heard that all of us has a God-shaped hole in our hearts? As sinful beings, we try to fill that hole with some other things, like fame, money, career, relationships. Some people even turn to drugs and alcohol. And if you listen to people who try to fill that hole with something else, they will tell you that they did not get any satisfaction. They still feel empty, even after they have attained that thing that they thought would fill them. They thought that what they were chasing after will fulfill them, but in the end, it failed to do 
what they thought it would do. The reason is we were made to worship God, and only thing that can fill that hole is God himself. And God knew that his people needed to worship him. And that is why he was sending Moses. And he says in verse 12, the reason I'm going to do all of this is so that you can bring them back to this mountain and worship me. And that is the exact same reason why God sent Jesus to die on the cross on our behalf. So that we can worship Have you ever wondered why did God sacrifice his one and only son? Why did Jesus willingly come knowing that he would have to die for us? It is because God knew we needed him. That we would never be satisfied unless we were worshiping him. And I believe that that is why worship is so vital in our lives today. You can be like Moses making excuses why you can't do what God is asking you to do. But if you understand what God did for you, then whatever he is asking should be very easy. We need to do it out of love for God. Not because we think we will be punished if we don't do it, but understanding that God loves us that much. That he would die on the cross for us. So I want to end with these three points about worship. First is that in worship, we find satisfaction and fulfillment. When we worship God, we are doing what we were originally created to do. We are meant to worship God, and when we do it with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we will find satisfaction and fulfillment. Second, in worship, we find rest. Sabbath, which means rest, was set aside one day a week so that God's people can worship him. Many times when we think of rest or, you know, when we talk about Sabbath and resting, we think about relaxing and lounging around the house and doing nothing. But true rest comes when we acknowledge and worship the one true God. That's why the Bible talks about the final rest. The final Sabbath is when we go to heaven. And guess what we will be doing in heaven? Have you ever read through Revelations. Every time we get an image of heaven in Revelations, the angels and the elders are worshiping God. And that's what we're doing. We'll be worshiping God. That is a true rest. And third, when we worship, we are pleasing the one who saved us. Who deserves our worship? Is it the athletes, the movie stars, or the the politicians? No. The one who deserves our worship is our creator. And not just our creator, but the one who saved us from certain death. God in his infinite wisdom found a way to save us by sending his one and only son, Jesus, to die on the cross as a payment for our sins. He deserves our worship. So let us put aside our excuses and let us honor God one day a week by coming together as his people to worship him. So I want to commend all of you for being here today, worshiping our God together. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us so much that even while we were still sinners, you sent your only son Jesus to die on the cross for us. You saved us from sin. You saved us from death. But ultimately, you saved us so that we can worship you. Because in worship, we find fulfillment. In worship, we find true rest. And in worship, we honor you. For you alone deserve all the glory and praise. May our lips never tire of worshiping you. And may we long to gather together each week to offer the worship that you deserve. And we pray all this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.